schoolgirl beaten to death for refusing to sing allegiance to Ayatollah. Asra Panahi, a 16-year-old schoolgirl, was beaten by Iranian security forces and died on October 14th due to her severe injuries during the attack. Asra and other students refused to sing a propaganda song dedicated to Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, Iran's supreme leader. According to Iran International, Iranian plainclothes security forces then raided a school in um, Ardabil. The raid was part of the regime's campaign to force students to participate in pro-regime activities. Ten students were injured during the attack. Asura was one of the first reported casualties of the security forces attack. Officials denied any responsibility for her death, insisting that she died because of congenital heart disease. Uh, Yashar Hak, uh, Hakakpur, a human rights activist, reported that two other victims, I attack uh, Mikali and Hana Durduzani died due to injuries they received from the same attack, and a third is in critical condition. So let me do an overview. So there was a girls' school in the western Iranian city of Ardabil, and the school was part of the regime trying to create propaganda. So what they were going to do is round up all these students, send them to a location, and then film them singing this propaganda song called Salam for Monday. We've talked about Salam for Monday a lot on this show. And however, when they rounded up all these students and tried to get them to sing the song, they started protesting instead. And we've seen a lot of videos from across Iran of schoolgirls um, you know, when when greeted by government officials trying to tell them about, you know, the sanctity of the hijab and why you should observe hijab and all this stuff, just instead getting together in assemblies and just chanting back at them, you know, women life freedom, death to dictator, all this stuff. So that's essentially what happened, or my understanding of what happened here. So then they were protesting. And then after they were protesting and refused to comply with making this propaganda video in which they sing allegiance to, you know, kind of Imam Ali, but also subtext is Ali Khamenei. Um, oh, Imam Mehdi, not Imam Ali. Oh, excuse, excuse me. Um, they, uh, the security forces came and started beating the students. And... 10 of them had to go to the hospital because of the severity of their injuries. And one girl, at least one girl confirmed, Asra Panahi, died due to her injuries. There was a teacher's union that came out and confirmed like this narrative of what happened. And the regime has since come out and tried to do a forced confession with someone who was identified as her uncle saying, oh no, she died of a heart attack. Conveniently, all these young girls who were dying during the past month all seem to either suddenly do a self-deletion, I can't say the word because of YouTube, or suddenly there are just dozens of young girls in Iran or young people in general who have heart conditions that are just happen to be dropping dead at this time like it, it just they're not even like really trying with their propaganda and cover-ups anymore anyway so there was like a forced confession that came out um you know her parents are denying that this is what happened and according to some sources this information is less confirmed than other reports of like what happened to asra but there are some reports that there are other students that died as a result of their injuries from being beaten so severely by the security forces um and yeah gossam is saying there are videos of special forces cars entering girls schools this is really common i've seen videos of students outside their school like um basically after they were tear gassed by security forces just coming into the school hallways and start blowing tear gas at people um a lot of there's just been really really harsh crackdowns and the regime is failing to figure out how to handle an uprising where a huge portion of those uprising are children. They cannot find an appropriate way to suppress this, essentially. It's still like, it doesn't matter how old you are, we're coming at you with full brute force. 
in fact, just yesterday, today or yesterday, report came out where the government itself says that the average age of protesters is 17 years old. This is the government's narrative itself is now that this is pre on average minors who are getting involved and they still don't have, yeah, like I said, appropriate means in which to deal with this. Um, so Armin, what is your reaction to this? What have you heard about this specific incident? Well, a lot of <clears throat> boys and girls and men and women are, when they come out in the protest, I've seen there's a new trend is that before they go out into the streets, they're announcing that they're not suicidal and they don't have any heart conditions. Uh, and, you know, they're not going to go anywhere that they're going to be bitten by dogs or anything like that. Okay. Because a lot of these protesters who are killed by the regime keep like in the past month or so, Keep the government keeps telling you, oh, this one had this condition and that's why they died. And this one had a heart condition. This one was jumped off the building. This one, this, this one, that. So now a lot of people are saying, like, just be aware that I'm I'm healthy, I'm fine. And if I die, I didn't kill myself. I'm very much eager to live. And that I have, you know, I'm healthy. So I'm like, so it's just uh, it's just like everybody knows now what the line is and sometimes the excuses are so weird like there's so many young young people in iran that are dying of heart attacks for some reason in the past month like really like that's the narrative we're going with sure um i mean master amini's death was also since the beginning since day one they were uh, they blame it on some a brain surgery or something like they, that. No, they okay. It was so weird. They blamed it on multiple things. They blamed Masa's death on congenital heart issues, and then there were other narratives that it was a seizure disorder, and then, then there are other narratives that she had an underlying brain tumor that was operated on when she was young, and this is a result her her passing out and losing consciousness is a result of that. There was. There was a lack of consistency, a severe lack of consistency. Yeah, let me um, show you a picture if I could find it here. This is the answer. Here, this mm. is the answer that they write. These are Iranian schoolgirls, okay? Schoolgirls. And this is the response to the regime right now. This is like this is one of the best images I've seen come out. Actually, there's a there's a more beautiful one. I mean, not you know, there are a couple of good ones. Here's another one. Look yes, well, we need we need to talk about what this is in a second. But Armin, there are reports that the government has now ordered schools to remove the portraits of yes. Khomeini and Khamenei because they are fearing ha the destruction of these images. So, like, can you talk for a minute about how crazy that is and what that's like for you, for someone from your generation to be like the schools are being oh my God. themselves to remove these portraits? Because that's so significant. So, guys, for when I was these girls' age, <clears throat> even talking just slightly ill about these two figures, Khomeini Khamenei, would make our hearts stop, right? And I'm saying that as a person who openly not quite a bit, semi-openly questioned God and Muhammad's prophethood in school, okay? Like, I didn't, like, openly announce that that would be, that would end up in my execution, but I told my friends, I would tell some of my teachers about my doubts, about me being an atheist, okay? And it, so that's how rebellious I was. In an Islamic theocracy, I would tell people that I have left Islam. Okay. I even told once an officer that arrested me and he told me that I'm stupid and I'm going to get myself killed if I keep telling that to people. Okay. But even as stupid as I was with regards to how open I was about my atheism, I wouldn't even dare, dare think about saying anything remotely negative about these two, because that would be like, I would, my assumption that would be, that would, that would be the immediate end of me. Okay. I one time, oh, that's too much detail. Um, but now we have these girls doing this. This is beyond, like, I, this is unimaginable for my generation. For my generation, what these girls are doing is unimaginable. And it's so common now. Like, it's not just, like, you guys think it's this. It's to the point where schools are removing the pictures of Khomeini and Khomeini because 
they're not safe anymore. And all schools in Iran, and that, this is not just main cities. We're seeing stuff like this happening in villages and cities that nobody has even heard of. Like people, remote places that people didn't think like were con too conservative for people to come out and do, do stuff like this. We're saying like people come out in like very conservative rural areas and coming out and saying Zans in the Gaza deal, like what the hell is happening? Right? This is beyond bizarre. This is a trend that is beyond bizarre. But anyways, um, I wanted to show you this other picture because this um, protest, although it's not for women, okay, let me be clear. These, this revolution is not a revolution for women, okay? It's for everyone. But we need to talk about this. We need but, to talk about this. Okay. Okay. However, it is led by women. Okay. So <laughs> it is a woman led revolution, even though it's for everyone, led by a woman for everyone. So that's why this picture is now the new um, picture that is highlighting your it's, it's just perfect. It's just perfect. It's like, look, guys, this gathering was people going to. Masters Amini's burial ground on his 40 day remembrance day uh, after her death, right? So, and the people and the, everything, the roads, the government knew that this was going to happen. So, they blocked all the roads to her grave, to her tombstone, right? So, people went by foot, they walked towards it. And estimates suggest that more than 50,000 people showed up. I mean, I don't know, wow. if some people say more, but this is insane. Fifth, like, Officially, so I don't know what, the, but it's it's crazy. And the fact that this lady is standing on top of a car and directing people like this way, it's just like such a beautiful representation. I saw, I wish I had the video for this. I saw another girl on a car taking off her job, waving it and stuff. I don't know what she was doing. Either taking off her job or like protesting. And guess what the car was? Okay. It was a police car with the police in it. <laughs> so, yeah she was on top of like the armed forces that were there for the she climbed the, like she was, was like on top of the car like that's wait, it wasn't a moving vehicle right it was parked no no it was no no it was like in traffic stuck in traffic or whatever like oh, okay. i don't know it was parked or something but the police were still in it like that's how like <laughs> <laughs> like that's how brave these people are getting i'm gonna find that video and i'm gonna show that's show freaking it awesome yeah so i think we should talk for a moment about like how significant this is so for a, many people probably don't know that the 40th day after someone's death is when it's a very important commemoration, specifically the 40th day. So this day of memorial, and Armin, I asked you why 40 days and you sent me a link. It didn't actually really give me a good explanation. Like why 40 hey, days? So I, there's, I, I don't know the reason, but we grew up always knowing that 40 days after somebody dies, you do another ceremony or another remembering of that person. Okay. I thought it was Islamic uh, tradition, but then I realized that apparently Orthodox Christian also has that tradition. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know the sources. I just know it's a thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So for protesters, the 40th day, so of the death of somebody in the, that was mattered a lot in the protest becomes a rallying cry for protesting again right so that's what it was, it was i don't know the origins of it's called the chelle chelle means like the, right mm. um so i think but, one thing that's really important is that so we had the 40th day memorial for masa which was huge and massive and the videos and photos coming out of that were making me so emotional but then one thing that we have to consider is that for every person that has died or been killed in these protests, their funeral and their memorial becomes itself another protest. And so a few days later, we had the 40th day that commemorated the disappearance of Nika Shakarami who was also a young girl about 16 she was 16 years old who was murdered and then her disappeared and then her body ad abducted by security forces and so then her memorial was also huge and we're going to continue to see this over and over again for every person that has been murdered by the regime as they're fighting for their free expression and ultimately for regime change. And 
they can't this regime i don't know like what they're going to do because they have an inability to change their tactics right at these protests at these memorials they're still shooting at people so you're just creating more martyrs you're creating more momentum for each funeral for each 40 days that passes there's more and more momentum as this touches people over and over again in every corner of the country. Like, I don't, and then with the story that we talked about with Asra Panahi, like beating schoolgirls to death for saying, why did you beat Masa to death? It's like the inflexibility of their tactics is going to be the end of them. How are, how, how are you, it just, it just, they are complete every single day proving over and over and over again, why they're brutal, cruel, and illegitimate because they cannot seem to conceive of any better way to tackle the problems that they're facing from their perspective as the regime trying to maintain power. They're just continuing to shoot themselves in the foot at every single level as they continue to shoot and kill their own innocent civilians. I just, I don't see how from their perspective, there's any way out of this. How is there any way out of this if they continue to be this inflexible and use this brutality? I mean, Armin, what do you think about what I just expressed? I, I agree, <clears throat> and I think one thing that is making <clears throat> this a lot more devastating to the regime is the religious people joining it, right? Because it was one thing for previous protests where secular or anti-religious people to complain, and while the government knowing that it could control with just a, a minority but a very loyal base, okay? It relies on that minority base for its power. But now we're seeing a lot of people leaving that base. And I just wanted to, because they can, and, and this is what goes back to what you're saying. When they shoot at people, um, a lot of the even religious people, I mean, I shouldn't say even religious people, even pro-regime people are like, is this what we're about? Like they are, they're like, are we, the, are, we the, are, we the, are we the baddies moment? They're having that moment. Are we the baddies, right? And we're seeing more and more people giving up on supporting the regime. So, and I wanted to show an image I have prepared to show how a lot of secular people have won the hearts and minds of religious people on their side. Okay. I don't know if you've seen this image, but it's just so beautiful. I know. I love this so much. So describe it to people who are just listening. Right. So this is um, in, I think what it's a university. It says Danishka here or whatever. Um, but you can see it's in Iran, and the girls who take off their hijab um, are the ones who are protesting the against the regime because the, with this illegal act, okay? And you see another woman here who is chadori. So, so she doesn't just have the hijab. She has the most conservative way of hijab. The most So she is not just somebody who's put the hijab because it's mandated. She is a religious person, right? But so she believes in the hijab for herself because she's a conservative woman, right? But she's, <laughs> I don't know, Susie, we shouldn't leave because I was going to ask you a question. I don't know what it's called when you do the hair for somebody like this. She's just um, braiding her hair. The Chidori uh, woman it. is standing behind the be hijabi woman, the woman with, yeah, yeah, without yeah. hijab <laughs> and braiding her hair. It's so cute. It's so lovely. Yeah. <laughs> so she's so like the yeah like the woman who would like take off her hijab illegally to protest against the regime you have this really very religious woman right behind there braiding her hair this is i don't know how how to explain this is a bizarre image for me okay we don't see these people like in in the places where i grew up and was raised you don't see these people getting along okay and now they're getting along in the middle of all this chaos I don't know. I don't know how to. I don't. I have a feeling, and also something that I'm not used to, and I don't know how to describe it for people to know how bizarre, but like, beautiful this is for somebody mm -hmm. that this is so alien to. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if people understand what I'm saying. But like, yeah. 
But Dark Crystal. No, used because to, be. to, to you growing up, these were things that were diametrically opposed. And not only diametrically opposed, you would associate the Chidori with actually a threat to your security, safety, and a potential source of being basically an informant. Yeah. So to see someone who you've grown up associating with being an informant or an extension of the regime actually physically assisting someone in their rejection of the biggest symbol of the regime it's very incongruent to you <laughs> so um just to let you guys know pakistani defense force is an idiot in the live chat who doesn't understand things and he thinks so highly of himself and he kind of supports the Iranian regime. And um, he he comes here at pretending like he knows things, but he's one of the biggest idiots in our live chat, right? And he says, Armin is getting excited over, I said, Armin is getting excited over nothing. The Iranian government isn't going anywhere. They can call millions of supporters. Well, I'm getting, so, I'm getting excited over just this. You don't understand. Like your, the, your, the evil that you think you're supporting might not go anywhere. I don't know. I don't know about the future. Okay. I don't know anything about the future. Okay. I just see a shine of light in the middle of all this darkness. Okay. And I don't know if this shine, shine of light is going to grow. I hope it will grow. But even if it doesn't grow, I'm excited about seeing how you could have just a little bit of hope and a little bit of friendship and happiness and hope for a better future in the middle of so much evil like the human capacity for people to love each other and support each other even when they are suffocating under so much hate the fact that is possible that excites me so i'm not just excited about things that could happen in the future i'm excited over what i'm just seeing right now and fuck you by the way yeah, it's beautiful. I think because Pakistani Defense Force was like trying to bring up the marches and support that was seen in the streets of Iran after the assassination of Qasem Soleimani and saying, oh, look, they're millions. It's so much bigger than anything we've seen during the protests. But that was quite different because, well, what for a variety of reasons, but one of them also being there are a lot of people who had to participate in those demonstrations because of their jobs of being employed within the government. They have to participate whether they want to or not. Um, I wanted to show a few more images from um, Masa Amini's 40th day memorial, just because it's like so huge. Wait, let me start this one over again. Look at how many people there are. That is insane. Look at as far as the eye can see. It's crazy. Um, there was another one right here. Tens of thousands of people gather. In <laughs> Holy crap! Holy crap. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> Yeah. All right. I, I'm actually having having fun more with this idiot. Okay. First of all, look. look. It says Armin, don't be mad. I'm not being high so Usually, when people like you know how calmly I talk. Usually, when people talk like this, it's because they are raging. They are so upset and they're crying and they want to be like, oh, don't be. They're like, like holding their tears and crying behind the keyboard and like, don't cry, don't cry. And like, this is, this is like a, such a self report when they tell you don't be mad is because they are dying in their own rage. Okay. And here, let me show you how stupid this guy is. Um, oh, first of all, let me just show you because I wasn't making this, making this stuff up. This guy is actually a supporter of the Iranian government. Like he's saying the Iranian government will stand strong and so will Pakistan. Right. But also, let me show you how stupid this guy is. Like, it says, LOL, Armin and Sozana won't show the bigger pro regime. You are such a fucking moron. You're comparing crowds of people that showed up 
knowing that the government is shooting at them with crowds of people who the government brings into the streets themselves with the threat of losing your job if you don't show up? Are you serious? That's how stupid you are? Like, do you understand how more how moronic you sound like that? Do you this the comparison? Let me break this down to you because you have a child's brain, okay? The comparison would be fair if the regime was not shooting at people. Do you assume that if the regime was not shooting at people, how much larger do you think the crowds would be? The fact that we're getting hundreds of thousands of people coming out knowing that they could be the victims, that would mean that for every person that is coming out right now under these conditions, a hundred more people for every one person would come out if you didn't have such conditions. Like, do you really know? Do you really understand that the fact that I need to explain that to you makes you an idiot? You have to. Wait, I love this. Gregory is like Armin deconstructing a moron is a thing of beauty. We can clap for that. Um, I, uh, there's a couple of things we want to highlight really quickly. Shriash is pointing out that Selva Kumar just gifted 10 memberships to our community. So thank you so much, Selva Kumar. That's beautiful and amazing. Thank you not only for supporting us in our work, but also allowing more people to be members and use our fun emojis and get the membership perks. So that's awesome. And Green Jedi is saying, ooh, I'm green now. Thank you for the membership. So that's cool. Um, the other thing that's really important, well, I wanted to highlight this cute comment from Ghost Bunny. Ghost Bunny is saying, it's awesome to see women supporting women, even if their religious and personal ideals differ. And I think that's what's really important to highlight. Um, and there's also a um, important, oh, there's more people like Shriash in Higgs Boson saying thank you for the membership. Um, there's also a very important comment from D that I think we should highlight. So D is asking, what about the IRGC saying Saturday that this was the last day of protests? So for those who are not aware, the one of the leaders of the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, came out and basically said, like, today is the last day of protests. And people are interpreting that in a lot of different ways. But Armin, can you give us the overview? You're muted. Before I answer that question, can I show oh. you one more video? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Because I want you to show. I, I, I'm not going to. Okay. You know what? I'm not going to explain it before I show it. Okay. Is this I'm the one you sent you... me? Yes. Yes. Okay. No, we no, have no, to give not... people a heads up. No, this nobody dies here. I'm not saying that I'm not. This is another one. Oh, okay. Nobody dies here. Okay. And this is no, no, I'm not going to show the ones guys. There's so many videos that we can't show here. This is not that one. Okay. But this is in the middle of the street on the right side. On this side, you have protesters on the left side. You have government uh, armed forces of the regime. Okay. Coming at to basically stop the protests. Right. So, but we have gotten to a point where you're going to see protesters coming and asking the regime armed forces to shoot them because they are basically oh the thing this they are telling the regime that we don't care what you do to us anymore like if you are here to intimidate us to go home by shooting us we are in this till the end like we are here to sacrifice our lives if need be like look how willing we are for us to give up our lives to keep this going but look at look at the protesters coming in and asking the armed forces to shoot us watch this they say bizan means shoot shoot and they're all pixely so that they can't be identified Look at this, this lady is like underneath, like shoot, shoot me. And these are the armed forces. Anyways, this is, so yeah, this is where we are at, at the protest right now. 
Like, yeah. Like... Yeah, seeing that video made me cry for a really long time. Anyways, let me answer this question. So D is this question again is what about the IRGC saying Saturday was the last day of the protest? Okay, so it's not just the IRGC. There was an attack. Um, the government claims by ISIS on the 40th day on Masa Amini's murder. There was an ISIS attack on a Shia shrine in Shiraz, which is a city in southern Iran. Okay. And a lot of people, okay, and again, I'm not going to make any claims myself here. I'm just going to tell you what the claim is. The claim is that this was a false flag operation by the regime itself, and it wasn't ISIS. Or even if it was ISIS, it was allowed to happen, okay? Um, and the, uh, the reason is the regime says, the regime has a history of doing stuff like this. Even from the beginning, they burned a movie theater at Cinema Rex, which killed a lot of innocent people. That's made the revolution 400 successful. people. 400 people burned alive, right? That was 40, 44 years ago, right? And 20 years ago, they did another terrorist attack on the shrine in Mashhad. Uh, and that has been confirmed to be the regime itself on its own religious people um, in a false flag operation. So they we don't know, they have a history of doing this. So in what happened in Shiraz recently, just a few days ago, is that a gunman went into the shrine and started shooting people. I've seen videos of it. Um, and they say this is an um, ISIS guy. But the fact that it happened on the 40th day, when the day that they wanted to divert att attention, this was like, even if it wasn't them, it was a blessing to them. But if, if it is them, it shows that they actually shoot their own base. They shoot their own Shia in the religious people that is supposed to be their base. They're shooting them as a way to and here, here's the thing there's uh, reports of again i'm not saying any of this is confirmed but i showed it i showed the video i showed the post on secular jihadists of a regime posting the condolences to the family two minutes after the attack started two minutes after the attack started before the attack ended so the attack happened for 20 minutes two minutes into the attack the regime posted the condolences to the, uh, to the uh, family and only one hour after the attack, the regime concluded that this was a ISIS attack, right? It was a Wahhabi attack. Usually these things take time, investigations, but they were confident enough to say that, right? So that makes a lot of people suspect that this was the regime itself. And a lot of government, the highest government officials have not said anything about the protests for the past month or so. But right after this attack, they all came out one after each other saying, oh, this is it. We have to stop the protests. We need to bring in more higher higher power. We need to bring in like military forces and stuff like that because this is the, the end regime of has immediately yeah. tried to tie this ISIS thing to the protesters explicitly, even there's no yes. evidence. Yeah, so they're saying no. The tie is like because of the chaos, ISIS is taking advantage. They're, so the regime has this narrative of there are good protesters and bad bad protesters, right? So this because the regime doesn't want to act like they're anti-protest because the protest is literally the right to protest without any permission or anything is within Iran's constitution. Like guys, like you understand the regime is that shooting at the people. This regime has a constitution that says that people can't protest against the government without any permission. It's in the constitution and they're shooting at people. So the narrative that the regime has is that these are not actually protesters. The, the protesters that we're shooting at are Zionist or imperialist puppets that have an ulterior motive other than protest. So to do that, they usually say the good protesters are talking about the economy and we understand that they should be able to protest. The bad protesters are, are the ones who want to get naked and have sex, random sex with your sisters and your daughters and your wives. And that's why they want to get rid of the hijab because they want to ruin the family unit and all that stuff. So they say that's because they say the Zionists understand that the only way to, Iran is so strong that they can't take it down with the military. Like the, people like this, uh, Pakistani uh, defense force guys in live chat, the idiots like that, they figure, oh, Iran is so powerful that the entire West and powerful forces in the world couldn't take it down. So now they're using, Zionists have like so frustrated. So now they're taking off the hijab and all because they, only, they know the only way to take down the regime is to corrupt the family from within because the society is built on its family unit and all that nonsense, right? So 
um, they're saying that's the bad protesters and that's why we, so, they, and they're taking advantage of real protesters who their actual concern is economic issues, which we which we completely understand. And we allow people to protest against that, which we, they don't actually. They also And also if we people. talk about economic issues, it very conveniently can be used for narratives surrounding lifting of sanctions is also the subtext. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So with this context, now the pro-regime people in Iran who are like, oh, there are a lot of pro-regime people in Iran who like wouldn't be ha happy with the government coming out with full force, right? So right now the forces that you have against the people are like the Basijis and, you know, IRGC, not IRGC, like Nire and Tizami. So you don't have the actual army, for example, moving in, right? And, you know, for that, that would be devastating for the regime's image to its supporters because they understand that if they go full force, there will be more people leaving their base and joining the people, right? So they need a story. And now the story is like I go into a lot of these people's social media rooms and uh, online. And I see what the narrative is, and they have accepted this lie. Like, okay, the protesters in the street have now is going too far, too and too long, and it's now making the country insecure enough for ISIS to be able to make attacks like this. And we need to stop the protest by whatever means necessary. So it's basically a gov what the accusation is, is that the government needed an excuse to basically come up with this new narrative. And now you see a lot of people who didn't have any statements, like we haven't heard a lot of statements from very high officials in the country about any of these protests. Now they all came out and were like, okay, now the protests need to stop the protests, including IRGC uh, top commander. Um, I mean, he had statements before, like, but he has he's come more aggressively. Even Khamenei and Raisi, who had statements about this before, now are coming out and tying this ISIS attack to the to what protesters are making make, are allowing to happen, which is so such a stretch, by the way. Like, oh, you're protesting, so ISIS, an ISIS attack happened. Like, okay, sure, uh, but that's the narrative they're going with. But if the false, if this is true, so a lot of the anti-regime protesters are telling pro-regime people, like, look. They don't care about you. They will come while you're worshiping. They will come into your holy buildings and they will shoot you for their own survival. And that's why these people, this regime that you think is defending you will actually sacrifice you for their own survival. So that's the that's a battle of narrative that is happening. Right? Well, I mean, Khomeini himself said that he would sacrifice the Mehdi for the sake of preserving the Islamic Republic. Yeah, he said that. <laughs> so, yeah, he did Which that is too. crazy. Yeah, yeah. He said, no, he basically he said if it came between the life of the Mehdi and the survival of the Islamic Republic, we have to choose the survival of the Islamic Republic over Mehdi's life. That's what this man said. <laughs> so, oh, there's that. Crap. Yeah. Um. So, uh, blah, oh, we got blah, a blah, major blah. super chat. Yeah, oh, no, but it's related? like a question, so I want to yeah, okay. just answer it at the very end. Um, okay. because usually we don't do questions in this show. Um, however, I do want to say that according to um Iran Human, the Norwegian-based NGO Iran Human Rights, they have said that now at least two hundred and fifty-three people have been killed, including thirty-four children. So that's a current confirmed death count. But again, it's likely much, much higher because of the problems of internet restrictions. Also, we don't really have a good idea of how many people have been injured because a lot of people, when they get injured in protest, they refuse to go to the hospital because they're concerned about security forces coming in and arresting them while they're trying to seek medical treatment. So there might, it's likely that there are more people that are dying at home that we don't have a record of because they succumb to their injuries essentially because they can't seek medical treatment um and i uh yeah the numbers of deaths published are an absolute minimum reports of protesters killing in the last few days are still being investigated iran human rights has received a high volume of reports of deaths which continue to investigate with internet disruptions the actual number of people killed therefore is certainly higher um there's also 
upwards of around possibly 13,000 people who have been sent into detention. And there are horrific reports of what is happening to people in detention, including, I think it's really important to talk about this, um, systematic RAPE. I cannot say it because of YouTube, but we do know that there is systematic R-wording happening within these prisons. One, because the regime has been doing this since its conception. But two, because now we are getting reports from people who were detained and then released about the conditions that they're facing. So I was reading the um, uh, witness account of uh, a prisoner who was in Tabriz, and which is in Western Azerbaijan province, I believe. And they were talking about how the, the torture that they experienced, the torture that they witnessed other prisoners going through, other detainees going through, to the point that the the person described this table where they use a spreader bar to separate your legs, and it had been used so many times that the table is sagging. The table has warped. And this person talked about how so obviously within these prisons, there are people who are political prisoners, there are people who are protesters, and then there are people who are in these prisons who are just actual criminals, like actual petty criminals or violent criminals. And what the regime does is they say to the people who are thugs, violent criminals, hey, we'll give you reprieve, we'll give you extra privileges, or we'll let you go on furlough from prison, basically if you brutalize these detainees, if you brutalize the protesters, we will give you benefits. And the regime has a long history of hiring thugs, including during Bloody Aban in 2019, when over 1,500 people were slaughtered in the streets, where they would hire thugs and violent criminals to just go after civilians. So this person in their eyewitness account was talking about how they witnessed these thugs and criminals are wording extremely young protesters and detainees systematically are wording detainees and so the conditions that people are facing once they are detained and once they are imprisoned are absolutely horrific the person who they were interviewing in this piece i was reading basically talked about how they can't even they can't leave the house anymore because one they're fearful and two they just they just break down. They're including reports that I've been looking up that I'm not able to confirm, but given the history in the regime, it's not unconce inconceivable. Basically, this young girl, her name is Amrita, I think, um, Abbasi, who's 20 years old, who was taken to the hospital because she was R-worded so many times that she was on death's door from internal bleeding. And there has been many cases of this happening to women in the past. And when this girl, Amarita, was taken to the hospital, basically she was abducted to the hospital and people can't find out where she is. They don't know what her status is. They don't know if she succumbed to her injuries of internal bleeding because they've just disappeared her. And where with that case, I will say, I haven't been able to confirm this, but like I said, it's not inconceivable. Um, and it's horrific, but I need people to understand like the depths of what we're dealing with here. This is a this is a government, a regime that within its system, from its inception, when it detains women who are virgins, they are word those women because Islamically, they are not allowed to execute virgins. So they do a false nika, they do a forced marriage to a guard or something, a besiege, then R word that woman so that she can then Islamically be executed. I mean, this was reported by some people that this happened in the 1980s. I don't know if that's, I mean, that's not happening now. I mean, I haven't seen any reports of that happening now because if it did, I'm. Oh, I'm just yeah. saying that yeah. to say that I, that's yeah. what I said in the beginning. I said this is within yeah, is. the history of the regime yes. that they use these task tactics of systematic R-wording. Yes. Yeah, it's this regime. Just, list, yeah, just so we're uh, 
um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Okay, we, we have to be skeptical about the, these things because I have looked into that as well. It's very possible, okay, but but let's just be skeptical about everything over here. That's why um, I said you, repeatedly that it's. Yeah. I haven't confirmed some of these things, but yeah, so. they're not inconceivable. They're not okay. at all but, inconceivable. Okay, okay. So just to be clear, um, we're not saying that about other things that we said. Like when we're saying we're skeptical about this, we are skeptical skeptical about everything. But the other things that Susanna pointed out, she verified. She's being very careful uh, to tell you what ha she hasn't verified. But the other things that she has mentioned, she has verified the, the, the stuff that we said previously. Like the story at the top of this hour with Asra, who yes. was beaten to yes. death. Like I waited two weeks to talk about it because I wanted to see more confirmation of this report, which is why I waited to talk about it this week. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm not, when I cannot confirm something, I say so. Okay. Um, do you want to show these pictures eh, from Babak? You're muted, you're muted, you're muted. I said, yes. So this is more of a happier note. Last week, I talked to you guys about how last Saturday, there was the huge historic protest in Berlin, which is like the largest protest of Iranians internationally joining together um, ever in the history of humankind. And I said that our atheist republic leader at the Persian channel, Babak, he went and he was photographing everything. And so I wanted, I said that once he had like process, processed everything and processed his photos that we would show them because I wanted to see, I wanted to show you guys this protest, you know, from Atheist Republic's eyes on the ground. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, he just took a lot of really awesome photos. I uh, thought that, yeah, they're just so cute. Um, he said that when you look at the photos that we see from the news, um you see you know the big rotunda and then the statue and then all the people in berlin you know going down the streets that um are like a you know the spokes of a wheel coming off of this rotunda right but he said it was actually bigger in person because in between these roads right there are all these trees and he said that like the the trees and the forests were filled with people as well so it was even larger than what you could see um uh -huh. from above yeah, like, look at this. Look at these crowds. It's crazy. Um, I am. Um, it he, was it, it's between 80,000 to 100,000 people showed up. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Um, one thing that I really liked is I uh, was talking to him about like what it felt like and what it meant to him to be there. And um, he's <laughs> he told me the most beautiful thing he was like it was trying to describe how he felt like it was he felt like he got to experience what iran could be like because he was like in berlin when everyone came in for this protest this demonstration like Everywhere you went, it was Iranians. He was like, in the bathroom, it was nothing but Iranians. On the bus, it was nothing but Iranians. So he felt like he was like in Iran, but outside of Iran. And he said that it was so beautiful because as someone in the diaspora, like oftentimes you'll see someone who's Iranian, but you'll want to avoid them. Um, but he said here, like, everyone was so excited to see each other they'd ask what city they're from they'd bond they he got to see what it would be like to see people free in the streets expressing themselves hugging kissing celebrating dancing having music um and i don't know it was just so touching to me and i was so happy that he got to experience that and share that experience with us because um i know for a lot of people when they go on social media and they see what's happening back home for them it just cuts their heart open and i can imagine how 
powerless they feel. But I think it's beautiful that people get to go to demonstrations like this and experience it and get to feel so hopeful and get to feel genuinely empowered and um, so encouraged by the unity that they're experiencing and how people are putting aside differences and ethnic divisions mm -hmm. and language differences and political differences just for the sake of their homeland and the suffering that their friends and family go through. And I don't know, I just think it's really incredible and extremely important. Um, yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, there okay, are, oh, go ahead. Yeah, we need to do some super chats. Also, yes. I think we should finish the super chats, even the question ones, before we go to, we could do them before, between the every news. It's okay, I think we can do it. We don't have to leave it for the very end, okay? Uh, by the okay. way, this is, I don't know, so we got Gregory gave us a 14 czar. I don't know what the currency that is. But South Africa. Think, South African. And this is woman life freedom in what? Oh, in the South African language, right? Is that, I don't know how to. Shoja. I have no idea Shoja. how to pronounce that. But let me try to say this. Okay, I'm sorry for butchering this. Thank you for your super chat, Gregory. Okay. In Kululeko, Yobomi, Bomfazi. Okay, that's pretty good. Cool. I think, I, I think you nailed it. And here's a, wait, before before I uh, highlight that, um, Vild Rose is saying, please like, share, and subscribe to Atheist Republic. Yes, please do that right now. And that help, really helps our channel. And Selva is saying, Selva got 10 people memberships. And Selva is saying, that's my way of celebrating my birthday with AR. Oh, happy birthday. Oh, Thanks happy you. birthday, Selva. Yay. All right. And this is the 10 pound super chat. Thank you. That's very generous. Thank you so much for your support. Um, I think the username is stop scamming, stop scamming man. Okay. You want to read this? I think this is up your alley. He said in Catholicism, the priests believe only they can deliver sacraments that can save people from hell and give people and get people in heaven like Eucharist and confession. Is there some equivalent among Shia Muslims? Well, you don't really, Muslims don't even really have sacraments in the same way that Catholics do at all. And your conception of the position of the Imam, I mean, in Shiism, there is way greater emphasis on emulation that is somewhat more similar than what you have in Sunnism, but it's still completely different because in Catholicism, the priest is acting as taking on the role of Christ himself, which is very different than a, a marja in Shia Islam. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, so I think the main point of this question is that are there middle men as holy men that are necessary? And I think in like in Protestant Christianity, there are no middle men necessary. You can have a one-on-one -on -one connection with God. In Catholic Christianity, middlemen are necessary. You need middlemen between you and God. Like that's why the priestly class makes themselves necessary. And I think your comparison to Shia and Sunni Islam is accurate. Sunni Islam also claims that you don't need any middlemen. You could have a one-on-one -on -one connection with God. And Shia Islam claims, it's, it's tricky, they claim that you would be stupid to not have a middleman, right? They don't claim it's necessary, but they almost make it seem like it's necessary, right? The, the idea is that just like you need a mechanic for your car, because you don't know how to fix your car, you can't know everything about how to fix your car, just like you go to a doctor when you have health problems, you need to go to a marja for religious problems, unless you are an expert yourself, okay? So yeah, maybe you could fix your, your own car if you're an expert. Maybe you are a doctor and you could take care of, you, you could write your own prescription. And maybe you're a religious scholar and then you are a marja yourself. You don't need a marja, okay? But they say that's very unlikely that you're a, mar you, you're a scholar, okay? And if you're not a religious scholar, then 
you are risking hell fire with not having a manager right because when you have a merger a person who you follow you, you they tell you what's haram and what's halal and you get guidance then if they make a mistake it's not on you anymore you you pick the merger you did proper investigation you pick the merger and they told you this is haram and you didn't do it you tell this halal and you do it so even if you made a mistake you that's the way to not burn in hell like you made you're doing something that's haram but your manager told you it's okay so even if it's haram but you're, you're fine but if you don't have a merger and you're not a scholar you could go yeah you could risk it but this way every time you sin because you thought it's not a sin or you didn't something you didn't do something that is necessary then you're going to burn for it so it would be they say it's idiotic not to have a merger so technically yeah you need a middleman um so it makes it more similar to catholic doctrine than protestant doctrine yeah 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 yeah, I mean, it, that, that whole conception is like very different than what's in Sunni Islam. Yes. To be clear. By the way, you, in Iran, you need to be a manager for you to even be considered for being a supreme leader. Okay. And Khamenei was not a manager when they made him Oops. a supreme leader. It's like, basically, it, it's against the Iranian constitution for Khamenei to be the supreme leader. So there's that. You can now get the sexiest blasphemous art ever known to mankind for free. Too sexy to show most of it here on YouTube. We draw Muhammad, Hindu goddesses, sexy hijabi art, Jesus, Mother Mary, Japanese God, Greek gods, and much, much more. Click on the link below where it says get our free blasphemous art.